Hello, my name is Fiona Geyser, and today I will be describing an entirely student-driven project. In our medical assistant class, we deal with the topic of smoking cessation because the medical assistants are expected to interview patients on their smoking status. In the course of this training, one of the students last spring was very concerned about her exposure to secondhand smoke. She was a former smoker and had achieved that with a great difficulty, yet she was still socializing in and even living with uh, the smokers in her lives. So the my objective was to identify a assay, some sort of test, quantitative test, that would help uh, answer her questions. So what is secondhand smoke? Uh, it's really the side stream smoke that also contains nicotine as well as carbon monoxide and uh, the carcinogens. The health effects of secondhand smoke was first quantitatively realized after the smoking bans, public smoking bans in the United States. As you can see on this graph, within a few years there was nearly a 50% reduction in ischemic heart disease. Most people think that the level of smoking that we observed in the 1950s had always occurred in the United States, and that's not true. It's really an activity of the past century. Before that, the only people who really engaged in it were uh, the very rich uh, in terms of uh, smoking cigars or pipes. By 1970, it was believed that over 45% of the adult population in the U.S. smoked. But that has dropped considerably in the past 40 years to where it's now plateaued at about 20% of the adult population. In the late 1990s, quantitative assays uh, were, became possible using chromatography techniques. And the metabolite that was selected for the, those assays was cotinine which is structurally very similar to nicotine. Nicotine has a very short half-life of just a couple hours, but cotinine has a half-life of nearly a day. And it is possible to now quantitate a person's exposure to secondhand smoke um, and, even in, and whether or not they're a smoker um, over a period of a week. What was found before the ban using this assay is that waiters, in particular in restaurants, were being exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke, as were airline stewardess. And this graph shows why the secondhand smoke uh, is a problem in terms of there's really zero tolerance in terms of ischemic heart disease. What it, now that we can quantitate uh, the level of an individual smoking, it's now known that just one cigarette a day is sufficient to cause platelet aggregation. So coronary heart disease is a problem, a health problem for adults in addition to um, other effects on the lungs. But probably the biggest concern, in addition to the coronary heart disease, is the effect on the fetuses um, from pregnant women. It's now known that the um, smoke, tobacco smoking is one of the leading causes of low birth weight in uh, the fetuses of mothers who smoke as well as miscarriages because the carbon monoxide in particular interferes with placental attachment. Nicotine can be analyzed directly in hair, for instance, or in toenails. And this graph illustrates the levels of nicotine that have been found in a 
pregnant mother, and then also in uh, the hair of uh, her infant. And But a big concern is the occurrence of nicotine in the hair of a non-smoking mother who is in the presence of secondhand smoke and in her infant. So after looking at this data, the class determined that for their assay, they would uh, they wanted a test that analyzed cotinine. And it just so happened there was a test that had recently been FDA approved, um, had two forms in terms of analyzing saliva and urine. The manufacturer provided the class with strips for both, and the class evaluated and selected the urine test as easier to implement, actually, and more suitable for the secondhand smoker. Now, the test is a ladder where if um, an individual is a smoker, say 10 to 20 cigarettes a day, they would uh, show a response at the highest level. If they are a non-smoker or they're successfully avoiding secondhand smoke, they would show a zero level. And the, um, the biggest concern is the level three, which would be indicative of two situations. Either they're being, the person's being exposed to secondhand smoke, or they might be occasional smokers, um, say one cigarette a day cannot rely now on personal reports about whether a person's a smoker or not, because many people who are occasional smokers or social smokers um, <clears throat> will actually say they're a non-smoker. And so the class analyzed their results, <clears throat> and out of the 10 uh, individuals, uh, we had this distribution. Uh, five tested at a level zero, uh, two less to, tested at the highest level, and there were three testing at the level three. Then when we correlated the results, we found that indeed the, the two individuals uh, who test at the highest level did smoke uh, 10 to 20 cigarettes a day, a pack a day, and the five non-smokers uh, consisted of one individual who had just stopped smoking about six months before and who had made considerable effort to avoid secondhand smoke, and she was very pleased that she tested as a non-smoker. But most particularly, there was one pregnant woman in the study who was making considerable effort to avoid um, smokers uh, in her life and she was very pleased with this result. But the three non-smokers, or reported non-smokers in the group, uh, were not, were really quite concerned about their result. And what we were unprepared actually for the reaction of those three individuals because they, um, they, they were emotionally very upset about the fact that they, even though for two of them they had stopped smoking at great effort, they were now considered passive smokers. And they, over a period of a few months, actually reported to the class that they used the strips, the nick alert strips themselves, to show the smokers in their lives what they were, quote, doing to their body. So in looking at the, the results of this um, study, it really ver is very much the stages of assessment in which a individual first realizes that there is a problem. I mean, we use this all the time when we provide students with a pretest so that they uh, can realize they, they don't know certain information and, and hopefully that motivates them to study. Well, that's what happened actually 
we now know with the NIC alert results. And uh, this is also a algorithm that's used in uh, attempting to um, get people to stop smoking um, in terms of just becoming aware there's a problem. And quantitative assays uh, are used also with uh, smokers. They can use carbon monoxide measurements, but that's not suitable for the low levels that would occur in passive smokers. And once they're aware of a problem, then there's a period of uh, contemplation and then um, action. Well, it was easier for the smokers to take that action uh, because they weren't addicted. So this is uh, another presentation of that process in exactly what we observed with the non-smokers in terms of uh, actually taking action um, to, to reduce their exposure to the secondhand smoke. So the, in conclusion, the class found that the non-smoker can be instrumental in helping the smoker reduce their smoking or even to quit. And probably the first step is to simply ask the smoker to smoke outside of the home or, and also to not smoke in the car or anywhere where there's a non-smoker, especially children, present. 